Okay. So I'm going to start off with a quick little welcome. Um, I'm going to be your host today. I was hoping to have Lauren, my my um, my associate at work, to give me a hand because she's usually running all the stuff uh, during work, and unfortunately she wasn't available. Um, sound and technology. We find that when we're doing these things, um, sometimes right at the beginning, the sound gets a little out of sync. So if you're just a little bit patient, it usually catches up. And any technical issues, if you are online, just pop into the um, um, just pop into the question box. Type something in there. If there's if there's a serious issue, please raise your hand. Um, I see that Tom has got his hand raised, so I'm just going to unmute Tom for a sec. Tom, are you there? Tom, no, sorry, I thought my hand was down. There we go. Cool. All right. Um, <clears throat> uh, so any technical issues, and then I uh, just want to introduce you to your control panel which looks like this. At the top, there's a little red arrow to collapse it if you want a little bit more real estate on your screen. This will switch you to full screen mode, and then as we've already seen, you can raise your hands. Um, so I've got that panel open and ready for me to, uh, to respond to. Our format, as promptly as possible, we want to start at 8 p.m. And again, we're recording these sessions, so if you do pop in or pop out, um, you know, recognizing that life happens, then you can always uh, catch the recording later, and what we'll do is we'll uh, we'll set up a YouTube channel and post it. Maybe do it through flight training and safety or something. I'll I'll work that out with Dan later. Um, oh, finish by 9 p.m. Not 10. Oh, I thought I fixed that. Oh, I hate it when that happens. Um, so, no, oh, that's the wrong one. There it is. Yeah, so we're just going to fix that real quick. There we go. Yeehaw. All right. Now, at the end of each evening. Um, we're going to have a quiz, and in your control panel, there's actually a handout feature. Uh, so at some point before the end of our session today, pop in there and download the PDF. Um, each quiz reviews the session. So for tonight's Theory of Flight, um, that quiz will review the session, and it's really kind of based on the type of questions you're going to be getting on the Transport Canada exam. So we do highly encourage you to... Um, Try those, uh, use them for for your study. Um, and at the beginning of each session, so next Tuesday, we'll review the quiz from Theory of Flight. Um, some reading, I think, Svetvan, you were asking about Soar and Learn to Fly Gliders. If you don't have your copy or if, you, if you've lost it, see Tom. That's our Tom. <coughs> Tom Robertson. Um, another really good book is From the Ground Up. Um, I still have my copy from 30-odd years ago. Um, it's still valid. It's constantly being updated. Uh, you can pick it up from Aviation World if you're if you're near an outlet, or even just go on to Amazon. So there's, there's a couple of really good books there. And, of course, one of the best resources is your local instructors within your club. Now, i um, just going to touch very briefly on what you need to write the Transport Canada exam you need to complete your ground school, so you'll be, we'll be issuing a letter from our CFI around that. Uh, you need a class one, two, sorry, one, three, or four medical. Uh, you need a letter of recommendation from your CFI, basically saying that you have completed the required amount of flight training and that you're prepared to write the exam, and that comprises of about 50% of the requirements for a license. Now, we actually have an evening a session on licensing and badges, so uh, when we do that session, we'll go into detail there. I'm just going to introduce you to your instructors. Uh, I'm going to be running the first three sessions. Um, for those of you who know me, I'm Dave Donaldson. I'm based out of Great Lakes Gliding. Um, and uh, we have two other instructors on the docket right now. Uh, Kerry, our CFI, he's the one on the left without the fur. Um, he's a, an extremely good instructor. Um, really can learn a lot from this gentleman. So he'll be handling probably meteorology. He usually likes to do the Met, and honestly, he's one of the best resources for that. And then we're also going to get Tom Robertson, our, our El Presidente. Um, Tom really enjoys doing the um, uh, the cross-country sections. Uh, we're also talking to Dan Lodge, who's a doctor, about doing the medicals. Um, I'm just not sure of his availability. And we will be working that out. We'll let you know who, who the instructors are for the various sessions as we go. So uh, others is yet to be determined, a.k.a. who dare. All right, so what we're going to do is I want to find out a little bit about you guys. 
Okay. Now to do this, we're going to do a couple of polls. Okay. So the first poll that I'm going to do, and I'm going to ask a simple question: Have you flown yet? So you should be seeing a poll up in your screen right now. Yep. Awesome. People are answering, so that's great. At 82% voted, looks like it's kind of um, finished. Now I think, huh? I think I just clicked something wrong. All right, let's get out of here. Okay, so what we have is 73%. Um, sorry, 82% have have voted. Oh, 88%. Thank you. 13% have not flown yet. That's very interesting. So that we have a couple people who haven't got into the seat, which is which is great. I mean, when I did my instruction, I did it um, uh, through cadets. You actually do your ground school first. 40% yes, but they're still flying dual. 27% uh, yes, but flying solo. We have no licensed pilots this evening, which is great. And we also have 20% of our people who are instructors. Um, within our club, we do encourage people to retake um, the retake the uh, ground school, we make it free to them. Um, oh, aha, that's how you share results. Now I see it. <laughs> All right. Um, so this is kind of my first time. It's actually funny. Chris Andrews made a comment saying this is, hey, I'm not used to being on this side of the thing because he does a lot of uh, webinars as well. Um, okay. So what I'd like to do now is find out a little bit about you and I think the easiest way to do this is we'll just unmute you all individually. I'll call out a name and I'd just like a quick little, you know, two line bio of, of who you are and which club you're at and what's your experience level. So as you know, I'm David Donaldson. I'm with Great Lakes. Uh, I'm going to start off with Anna. Anna, are you there? Let's move on to Arthur. Arthur? Okay. I'm going to unmute Dan Cook for a moment. Dan, do you want to just introduce yourself real quick? Did we just lose Dan? I think, no, there he is. Dan, are you there? All right, so this, this is definitely not working. <laughs> um, Within the question box, uh, just go ahead and type in, oh, Anna's saying no mic, sorry, um, no problem. Uh, so just type in a real quick little statement around, um, you know, if you know the number of flights you've had offhand, um, you know, your experience, that kind of thing. And again, at any time, if you do have questions, uh, please kind of, you know, blurt them out. Unfortunately, my software doesn't allow me to, to, sh um, um, to, um, the word I'm looking for to share the responses and the typing, so I'm just going to have to, to read them. So just go ahead and type in, um, you know, a little bit about what you are. So Kevin started GLGC June of 2015, 22 flights. Awesome, welcome, Kevin. Um, So Neil is from Winnipeg Soaring, and Neil, if you just wanted to give us a quick little statement of your experience, would be great. <laughs> oh, there's a little note. Um, Dan Cook is mentioning that we have an online copy on the SAC website, so I'm going to try unmuting you again, Dan. Let's see if you are there. So Dan, you're unmuted. Uh, Dan, Dan Cook is the SAC Chairman for Flight Training and Safety, and he's in BC in the Okanagan Valley. We're not at all jealous, Dan, really. Sergio, uh, been playing on and off <clears throat> uh, with Flight Simulator since it came out <laughs> on a floppy and decided it was time for the real thing. 
uh, work on the seventh floor just across Pearson. Nice. You've seen the planes all the time. Um, Razvan, he's in his final year for aerospace engineering, approximately 35 uh, power hours. And uh, started with GLC late summer, around 15 flights and one solo. That's right. You, We sent him solo last year. I'm um, and GLDC member for three years. Chris, he's now retired. Uh, been flying for around 15 years. Needs to write the exam, Chris. Come on, dude. Um, Arthur, 11 flights out of Toronto soaring. Welcome. Um, a whole 10 flights at this time from uh, set fan. Awesome. Uh, two intro flights with an instructor. That's Anna. Um, yeah, unfortunately, Dale, uh, Dane, I can't, I can't do that. So Dane was asking, is there a way to put text in another area? Um, Neil, yep, as soon as I figure out how the input box, screen. So he started flying August uh, 15th, 2015, 47 glider flights, 14 hours uh, training progress. Um, he is an electrical engineer. Uh, Karen. Um, oh, Karen's a fellow Winnipegger. So uh, Karen and Neil will have to connect on the email. Uh, started halfway through the summer last year, seven dual flights so far. Did a little bit of power before that. Fantastic. So let's get started into principles of flight, because really that's kind of what we're here for. Uh, Dane, you're entering place in the right. You're entering your data in the right place. So um, yeah, you're in the right spot. Okay. Now. I want to just pose this question as we get started. Um, why do we study theory of flight? What's the purpose behind this? If you just want to use your question box to pop in and type that. So why do we study theory of flight? I'm just going to let a couple answers flow in and then we'll, we'll have a quick discussion. Beautiful. <clears throat> okay, so when we, we talk about this, um, we started off with, with Sergio saying it's always good to know why things happen. and. <coughs> We sort of expanded on that very similar theme from other people um, to make us better equipped for judgment while in flight from Kevin. Absolutely. Um, understanding the principles of how flight works. Um, I love Dan Cook's answer. Uh, better understand why an aircraft functions the way it does. And if we understand why it functions, we can be more effective. Um, so we, we understand what's happening. Uh, we know how to control the airplane um, to better understand the physics of flight from um, Razvan and you know, gain knowledge prior to flight operations. Absolutely, from Arthur, safety. Oh, beautiful, Arthur, thank you. Yeah, it's really about, if we don't understand the machine that we're operating, how can we possibly safely operate it? So, when we look at theory of flight, it's really about understanding not only the parts of the plane so that we can, you know, sound really important to name them, um, but also understand what they do and how they're connected to the controls so that when we move the controls in a particular way, um, it, it reacts to the air in a particular way and we can understand, you know, what the heck's going on. And I really love that answer. Just it all boils down to safety. Because <laughs> at the end of the day, we want you and we want our toy back. Um, and really that's, that's kind of what it's all about. Now, when we look at the... Um, the study of theory of flight, there's there's kind of, in my mind, there's kind of two aspects to it. One is the aspect of being able to answer the questions when we're faced with the Transport Canada exam. There's going to be a fair bit of that in tonight's session because, I mean, really a big part of what we're doing this evening is helping you prepare for the exam. But we also want to make sure that you're understanding the concepts such that you can be a more effective um, and safe pilot. So when we talk about the parts of the airplane, um, and we look at them, you know, we've got ailerons, and this controls the roll. So this, this will lower a wing or, or pick up a wing. Um, we've got flaps, 
which slow our, our stall speed, typically use them for landing. We also often use them for um, takeoff and, and thermaling. Now, not all aircraft have flaps, so our Crosnos, uh, both Winnipeg and, and Great Lakes have Crosnos. Uh, they don't have flaps. I know at Toronto Soaring, you've got a, a K-13 and a Poo hatch. Again, not flapped airplanes. So from the glider pilot's perspective, we often do a lot of our training and a lot of our flying, uh, flying non-flap ships, and then we kind of move up into that uh, later. The elevator, which controls our up and air down, and we're, we're going to kind of go into a little bit more detail on this as we, as we progress. Um, the rudder, which controls our nose left to right in, in direction of yaw. And again, we'll, we'll kind of go into this a little bit more detail. So we kind of look at all these parts and say, one of the first things I want to always ask is, is it functioning correctly? And um, most of our gliders tend to live in a trailer at night. So we come out to the field in the morning and we put them together. You know, have we assembled them correctly? Have we connected all of those vital control systems such that we have a fully functioning machine? Because um, there's really nothing worse than, than being inside of an airplane and having a disconnected control because you're completely, um, you're completely, uh, you know, at, at the whim of the wind and the aircraft and, um, you know, if you don't have that, it's it's not going to be a good day for anyone. So <coughs> we look <coughs> at those different parts. And again, we'll go into a little bit more detail on that. What I'd like to do, though, is, is move into um, the four forces that are acting on an airplane. Now, this is one of those funny things where the uh, power description of this, there's actually four forces. There's lift, gravity, there's drag, and there's thrust. Now, in the power world, the thrust is created by the engine, and we're going we're gonna to reconcile that um, in a few moments. But I want to just ask the question, and again, we'll get you to kind of type in as we go. Um, what happens when lift equals gravity? What happens when thrust equals drag? So go ahead and in the question box, just type in what you think is going to happen in those scenarios. So we're flying along in, in, our, in our airplane, and uh, thrust equals gravity. Sorry, thrust equals drag, and lift equals gravity. What's going to happen? Oh, I love it. Hover. Steady level flight. Equilibrium is obtained. Equilibrium set a couple times. Lift equals um, gravity keeps the plane at a certain level. So it's actually not climbing or, or descending. Now, in truth, what's happening is it's actually not accelerating or decelerating. And, and that is a state called equilibrium. So for the test, they will likely ask you, um, you know, to define that term. And you're absolutely right. It's stable flight. <coughs> it's uh, you're not speeding up, you're not slowing down. Now, one of the um, kind of funny things about that is you can actually have lift equal gravity and be descending as long as you are descending at a stable rate. Okay, and Anna, you're absolutely right. They do cancel each other out. So what ends up happening is so they weren't canceling each other out. So for example, if gravity didn't cancel out lift, we would just keep climbing, 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 climbing. Or vice versa, if, if lift didn't cancel out gravity, we would just descend, descend, descend. Now, the state of equilibrium is such that lift equals drag and thrust equals, uh, sorry, thrust equals drag and lift equals gravity. Now, if I lower the nose and put this aircraft that we've got on the picture here, this power plane, into a shallow dive, maybe you know, pull the throttle back a little bit, um, initially it's going to speed up. Because right? I've lowered the nose, um, I've, I've kind of, in a way, increased thrust a little bit, and it's going to speed up a little bit. Then it's going to find its new balance. Right? It's going to find its new balance. And as long as you are not accelerating or decelerating, so if you are descending or climbing at a constant rate, let's say 200 feet per minute, you are actually in a state of equilibrium because you're not accelerating or decelerating. And that's kind of really the key here. Now, let's go back over to our glider. Because a glider doesn't have an engine. Most don't, some do. But when the engine's stowed, <coughs> oh, excuse me, the glider doesn't have an engine. So we have lift, we have gravity. Everything is affected by gravity. Our wings produce lift, which get us up off the ground. And of course, anytime we're moving through air, right, you're moving through water, you're moving through air, 
you're creating drag. So what we do to create lift is we tilt the nose down just a little bit. Now, the lift always acts at 90 degrees to the airplane. So it always acts kind of straight up. And we're going to actually see this a little bit later from the side, or from the front, excuse me. So by tilting the nose down a little bit, okay, so if we kind of go back, to, oops, sorry, go back to that level flight, right? Um, if we tilt the nose down a little bit, our lift is actually angled a little bit forward. So what we're going to do is we're going to turn that single lift line into two lines. One is the straight up lift, which is going to counteract gravity, and one is the forward, which is the differential of the two. This is how a glider creates thrust when it doesn't have an engine. And in fact, this is how a airplane, uh, be it an airliner or a, uh, you know, a private single engine, when you pull the throttle back to idle or you actually shut the engine off, this is how you create thrust. You lower the nose. Now, Kerry, our, our CFI, he likes to describe it as riding a bicycle down a hill. So if you can kind of picture with me for a moment, we're riding our bicycles, and we've got to the top of the hill, lots of puffing and panting. We crest the hill, and we're now heading down the hill. Do we need to pedal? And of course, the answer is no. So what we can do is we can kind of sit back and relax and let the gravity on that angle, which is really what's happening with our glider here, the gravity on that angle pull us down. Now, the steeper the hill, the faster we go until we reach a point of equilibrium. So if you can find yourself a kind of a nice shallow hill without putting the brakes on, you know, do this safely, and you know kind of go down it, what you'll find is you'll accelerate, you'll accelerate, you'll accelerate, so you're not in a state of equilibrium yet. Then the wind resistance and the rolling resistance of your tires and, and the mechanical losses within the, the system and all that will start to kick in. And that's going to be your drag. So when they balance each other, as Anna says, <coughs> they cancel each other out. Now, um, you may or may not re get this on the exam, but the important thing here is, and you've seen this in flight for those of you who have flown, we always talk about you know lower the nose to establish whatever speed. And by using a sight line, so if you're kind of sitting here in the airplane, you know this is your head, for example, uh, you're going to look straight out. And you're going to kind of look at this distance here, you know, between the nose of your glider and the horizon, and that's really your speed. And this is why we, we tell you, you know, don't read the airspeed instrument. Look up and out. And what's going to happen is you're going to see subtle changes, and then those subtle changes will respond, will turn into corresponding changes uh, within your airspeed. Now, if I just back up for a second, if I raise the nose so that I've effectively eliminated the list, <coughs> sorry, eliminated the thrust, what's going to happen? So I'll get you to type in your, in your question box. So you've just raised the nose to the point where you've effectively eliminated the risk. What's your airplane going to do? Or sorry, eliminated the thrust. Okay, so we got, we got several people saying stall, but think about what it'll do before, because eventually the plane will stall, Sergio, correct, but it will slow down, right? First of all, what's going to happen is it's going to slow down, right? And as it slows down, it's going to lose lift because we need speed for lift and so forth, and what's going to happen is it'll eventually stall if we don't correct this. So we need to kind of lower that nose a little bit. That'll create that thrust vector. We look out over the nose and we'll see... Um, uh, you know, we see where we're at. Okay. Now, again, we're going to continue on in our discussion around how lift is created. <laughs> There's air flowing over the wing. So here we have our drawing of our wing. You know, this, this red profile in the center here. And <coughs> we have air flowing over the bottom of the wing and over the top of the wing. And as this air flows, it takes a longer path when it goes over the top. Now, this creates a relatively low pressure, so we have a relatively high pressure on the bottom of the wing. 
And when we have that situation, what's basically happening is the high pressure wants to flow to the low pressure. And the low pressure kind of wants to, to, to go up as well. So we've got a low pressure, almost like a suction happening. Okay, almost like a suction happening. And there's a great little um, way you can test this by taking a piece of paper and putting it on your bottom lip and just blow air gently over the top surface. And what will happen is that piece of paper will rise up because you've got relatively faster air on the top, which creates a low pressure, and it, it relatively higher pressure on the bottom, and it wants to equalize. Now, airspeed, so the higher speed, the higher we fly, the faster we fly, the more we're going to have that flow and the more we're going to have that differential. So I want to just t talk for a moment here around factors that are affecting lift. And the main factors that affect lift, well, we start with our um, shape of the airfoil. And this is the, you know, how flat is the bottom surface, how curved is the top. And there's a number of standard shapes that are used for different airplanes. And next time you're helping rig an airplane, you know, before you put the wings in, take a look at that wing root before it goes against the side of the glider and you can have a look. The Krosno is kind of a neat one because it's got a very curved bottom surface. It sort of curves down uh, in a very pretty shape. Um, Things like a, like a 126, for example, has a very flat bottom, much like our diagram that we saw earlier, much like this diagram. The next one is the plan area. <clears throat> and this is a very fancy way of saying the wing area. So how much um, length and width of wing is there? We multiply those two factors together and we find out, you know, how many square inches or square feet or, uh, you know, that we have. Okay. So... Um, so the plan area is how big it is. Now, this is kind of the design of the airplane. So when you look at, you know, the wingspan, <laughs> the route, and there are some airplanes, some gliders that have interchangeable tips, which basically means you can uh, take the tip out and put a different tip in. Um, and we can take, you know, a, a 18 meter glider, for example, and turn it into a 20 meter glider by making it bigger. But of course, that's all done on the ground. The next factor, <coughs> excuse me, that's going to affect lift is air density. Now, the easy way to wrap your head around this one is stick your hand out the window while you're driving. You're know, driving down the highway, you put your hand out the window, and you'll feel the pressure of the air. Now, do that in a stream. And water and air have a lot of very similar properties, so fluid dynamics tends to be very similar. Um, so by putting your hand into a stream, you're going to an extreme where the air density is, or sorry, the density of the medium is, is much, much, much higher, like a thousand times higher. And it doesn't take very much current to really exert a lot of force. Um, so quick uh, question, Kevin, plan area, yes, is the surface area size. So plan area is the surface area size, right? So the, the width and the length. <clears throat> now, the velocity, and this is, again, an easy one you can, you can demonstrate to yourself. Put your hand out the window when you're at a stop sign and accelerate to 100 kilometers an hour, uh, assuming that's the speed limit for where you are. Um, and you will feel that the faster you get, the more pressure, right? So as we speed our planes up and we fly faster, there's more air flowing over the wings, and hence there's more pressure on the control surfaces. There's more pressure on the wing itself, uh, so it's going to create more lift. Um, so you know, airspeed velocity is going to you know have a big effect, and it's also going to have an effect on the drag because the faster we go, the more drag there is. Again, sticking your hand out that window. The faster you go, you can feel more pressure. You feel your arm being pulled back more, so there's more drag and so forth. Now, the last one is the angle of attack. Okay, and Svetvan, I'm going to come back to that question. So Svetvan is just asking about temperature and air density. Um, I just want to deal with angle of attack. Angle of attack is the relative angle between your wing and the relative air. Now, before we go into detail on angle of attack, I want to ask you which of these do you have control over 
And I've got a poll for this, so let me just pop into my polls here real quick. Uh, which one we get? And you can actually check off multiple on this one. So if you think we have control over two or three of these items, or all five, uh, feel free to check them off appropriately. Oh, you can really only check one? Oh, I'm very sorry. Apologies, I thought I'd made it check multiple. You know what, let me just pop into manage polls here real quick. And let's see if I can fix that. I don't know if this will take effect on the fly. So let me just close it. It looks like now that I've actually run the poll, I can't. Let me just pop in here and see if I can re. See if I can relaunch this guy. Now it looks like because it's closed. Okay. So what I'd like you to do is is pop into the questionnaire. My apologies on that. Um, pop it in the question area and uh, type this in, okay? So I'm seeing uh, for the, the voting that we, we did do, 75% voted, 8% uh, said shape of the airfoil, 33% um, said velocity, 58% said angle of attack, which, which is actually very true. Now, um, you're 100% correct, we can control our angle of attack. And we do this by moving the stick forward and back and raising and lowering the nose. Now, can we control our airspeed? Right? And sure, absolutely, because we, we control the speed of the airplane. <laughs> now, what about the shape of the airfoil? <clears throat> and I'm curious, because there's 8% 8, 8 of you said shape of the airfoil. So um, for those of you who, who chose shape of the airfoil, I'm curious as to how you're going to do that because the, the shape of the airfoil is kind of a pre-designed thing. So short of um, short of, of bolting on and unbolting an airplane or a, a wing, how can I do that? And the answer that Svetman um, responded with was flaps, which is absolutely true. So assuming that your aircraft is equipped with flaps, what that actually does is it, it not only changes the shape of the airfoil, but depending upon... Um, uh, depending upon what type of flap you have, it will actually increase your plan area. So if you if you think about like a 747 when you're looking up the wing, it it sort of extends back, and so you can kind of kind of control those two, but you have to have a kind of specially designed airplane. The the one we really don't have any control over at all ever is air density. Now, flying something like a Crosno or a 233 or a Puhatch or any of those type of airplanes, um, plan area, nope, and shape of the airfoil, nope. Okay, so I can't change those in flight, but I can control the velocity and I can control the angle of attack. Now, we want to just take a look at angle of attack, and so here is a wing flying along relatively level. There's nothing on my screen, Karen. I do not see the presentation. Oh, lost presentation. Are we, uh... oh, it stopped. What the heck? How's that? Are we back? Yay, thank you. Sorry about that. Let's back up. So we got that one, we we're talking about this. Um, shape of the airfoil, unless you have flaps, we can't change that. Plan area, unless, again, you have flaps and even certain types of flaps. Velocity and airspeed are really our two main tools. Okay. So as we change the angle of attack, three things happen. Um, the first is as we increase that angle of attack, we increase lift. Okay. Now, unfortunately, you don't get something for nothing. So the more lift you're creating, the more drag you're creating. 
And in very simple terms, what ends up happening is here I'm flying along fairly straight and level. So maybe a relatively nose low attitude here. I raise the nose to kind of this, this nose up attitude. And the air flowing over the top of the wing, as you can see, it, it's kind of pulling at the wing more. And the air flowing over the bottom of the wing is actually being compressed and pushed down. So you're going to have a dramatic increase in lift, but you'll also have a dramatic increase in drag. Now, if you're flying a power plane and you needed to uh, climb, for example, and you wanted to maintain your airspeed, as you raise the nose, you would want to add a little bit of power to compensate for that extra drag to remain at that same speed. With a glider, of course, as we raise the nose, we'll slow down. And this is, um, this is what basically happens when we raise the nose. Now, the stall is the eventual place that we're going to end up. If we keep that nose in a very high state and we're not adding sort of energy into the system via an engine, for example. Now, in a stalled state, if you look at the flow of air over this wing here, and by the way, these three images were actually taken from the NASA website where they have a simulation um, of an airfoil in flight, and, and you can kind of tilt the angle and it shows you what the airflow is doing. Now, <clears throat> you notice in this middle one here, we have relatively smooth airflow over the top of the wing. So the wing is still producing lift. However, in this one, the, the air flowing over the top has transitioned from that nice smooth flow that we see here, from this nice smooth flow that we see here, to a very turbulent flow. And when that happens, our drag goes way up, lots and lots of drag, and our lift drops to pretty much zero. And when this occurs, usually the airplane sort of feels like it stops for a second, the nose drops, and then we, we reestablish our flying. So what would be some of the indicators that would tell you you're approaching stall? And I want to do this from a from a, a glider perspective. So stall, horn, stall warning, not an option. So what would be some of the indicators that would tell you you're approaching stall? Ah, beautiful. I love it. Let's look at you guys. You're awesome. So the first answer was reduce wind noise. So as the airplane slows down, especially in something like a Crosno where we don't have a really good ceiling around the canopy, the noise, the wind noise reduces. We also see a reduced speed, right? So we've raised that nose. We're slowing down. Then we lead into buffeting, and you guys actually answered it perfectly. So good job. Uh, you know, lower wind noise, reduced speed, buffeting. Um, you know, quiet, loss of speed, shaking, we get turbulence, uh, you start to feel the turbulent effects. And you also get mushy controls, because now we're slowing down, we've got less airflow over the control surfaces, so even if you just move the stick a little bit, you'll notice that it's not as stiff as it was, right? Uh, lack of controls, right? Lack of loss of aileron effectiveness, right? So maybe a wing's starting to drop, and I try to use my ailerons, and it doesn't come up. <coughs> So these are all the factors that are going to tell us that we're heading towards a stall. And um, if we keep this state up, what will basically happen is we'll exceed our, our critical angle of attack and cause that airplane to stall. Now, just before we get into angle of attack a little bit more, I just want to cover off ailerons. And ailerons are much like flaps. They work out on the wingtips. And they actually kind of do change the plan of the airplane, or the, the shape of the airfoil. <clears throat> if we can picture our air flowing over the wing, I'm just going to use a different color for this one. I'll use green. Actually, use blue. There we go. You can picture the air flowing over this wing here. As it flows along underneath the wing, it's going to hit the, the deflected down aileron, and it's going to be pushed this way. And that's going to result in, a, in an up push of that wingtip. The other aileron, the air is going to flow along here, and the air is actually going to curve up like this and sort of get sucked up, and the air flowing over the top is going to be deflected, and what's going to happen is you're going to have a net push down, so this one's going to have a net push up, 
because as it as it hits that down downward aileron, the air is going to push that up, and this one's going to push that one down. So because one goes up, one goes down, we roll from one side to another. As many of you know, there's adverse yaw, <clears throat> and basically um, one of the tools we have to help counter adverse yaw is something called a freeze aileron, which is on that upward going one where we have reduced lift and hence reduced drag, we take a piece of the aileron and we stick it down into the wind. And the idea here is that the air catches that and creates a bit of drag, as opposed to this one where, although there's more drag being created because of the extra lift, it's not imp impeding within the airflow. Not many gliders have this. <clears throat> um, Schweitzer gliders do. But the Krosno actually does. So for those of us at Great Lakes and, and for Neil at, at Winnipeg, next time you're out at the field and you're DIing your airplane and you take that aileron and you push it up to the top to you know see that it moves okay, take a look and you'll notice that the leading edge of that aileron is actually sticking down just a little bit into the airflow. And this will help counteract that whole um, adverse yaw piece. Differential ailerons is the down one goes less than the up. So what we're trying to do is, is um, when you increase lift as we're doing here, you're going to increase drag. When we decrease lift, we're going to decrease drag. So by decreasing drag or decreasing lift more and increasing lift less, it, it helps counteract that a little bit. Okay. So our control surfaces, we're all pretty familiar with these. Ailerons, one goes up, one goes down. I guess you're going to change color here. here. <clears throat> so one goes up, one goes down. I'm looking for a good animation on this, folks. Hint. Um, the elevator, this acts as a unified piece. So when this side goes up, the other side also goes up. Okay, and then, of course, my rudder goes left to right. And we're going we're gonna to kind of dive into that a little bit in a second. Just before we do, though, I want to just cover off the angle of attack piece. So, and you need to know this definition for the exam. Be very clear on this. The relative airflow, okay, so this relative airflow. Now, this is not the direction of, of the aircraft is pointed. This is actually the direction it's traveling. In this scenario, in this picture here, the aircraft has its nose high, but it's actually traveling forward in a straight line at level with the ground. Now, it's going to do that, <clears throat> um, assuming we went from level flight and we kind of pulled back on the on the stick. It's going to do that temporarily. It's going to increase lift and drag, and then we're out of balance for a few moments. It'll come, excuse me, it'll come back into balance. The angle of attack, once it has exceeded what's known as the critical angle of attack, the wing will stall. Okay, so if you're taking notes. Please write that down. When your angle of attack exceeds the critical angle, the wing will stall. So let's say the critical angle is 17 degrees. Now, we have no way of measuring that when we're sitting in the cockpit. But what we do know, though, is the more we increase our angle of attack, the closer we get to stall. So if we want to prevent the stall, reduce your angle of attack. Now, let's assume for the moment that this is actually the critical angle of attack and this airplane is now stalled. Is this possible? So I'm going to get you to just do a simple yes-no here, folks. Is this possible? So you're pointing down towards the ground. Looks like about a 20-degree angle down, but you've actually stalled. Is it possible? So I'm getting, yay, um, <clears throat> yes, 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 and yes, 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 yes. And that is the correct answer. Yes, it is possible. Now, that might be something that you're kind of going, what? Because um, because what we're basically doing is the airplane is traveling down at a higher angle than it's pointing. Now, the way this would happen is if you were in a dive and you reached back on the stick really hard and really fast, right? we could actually stall the wing before it had a chance to change your relative direction. Now, this is actually pretty hard to do. 
to stall when you're actually pointing down. Um, now you can also stall in level fight and that's known as a snap roll. So when that angle of attack exceeds, it doesn't matter which direction your nose is pointing. It's all about the relative airflow. <coughs> so if you are getting to a state where you think the airplane's about to stall, you need to lower the nose. It's that simple. Um, for those of you who have flown the winch, um, I'll pop back over here for a second. For those of you who have flown the winch, um, we, we kind of do this a little bit, but the, the actual relative flow on a winch, and let me just, uh, whoops, uh, erase all ink on the side. There we go. If we're on the winch right now, our relative airflow is actually something like this because we're traveling, you know, up, 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 right? So we actually have a relatively low angle of attack. <clears throat> um, now, if the winch cable breaks, what's going to happen is momentarily our angle of attack is actually going to reduce because basically the airplane is being pulled down, which is increasing the angle of attack, and it kind of pops up for a moment. But if I keep the nose in that nose high attitude, as we've already de de determined, we're going to slow down and stall. So it's very important in a scenario where you are in a very nose high attitude and you want to prevent the stall is to push the nose very aggressively forward and get that nose down so that she can pick up airspeed and reduce that angle of attack. This scenario, let me just get rid of those. This scenario would have started with a steeper nose dive and then pulled up from that. Okay. So when you're looking at stall recovery and spin recovery, and we always say ease out of the dive, this is why. Because what we don't want to do is enter into a secondary stall, because if you pull too aggressively, you could stall the wing again. <clears throat> and that might be even in the case where you're not uh, yet re started refining the airplane, basically. Okay, so um, happy to revisit that with people uh, as we kind of you know go through our time. And um, again, if you have any questions outside of our session, please feel free to um, either reach out and contact myself or one of the instructors within your club. So let's talk about axes and movements. Now, this is one of those areas where. Um, and yes, Kevin, you're absolutely right. Elevator responsiveness does reduce as, as speed decreases, right? So uh, it is possible, depending upon the design of your glider, to get into um, um, to get into what we call a mushing stall, where if you gently approach the stall, you can get all the way back stick, and the airplane stall that's staying in the stall, but <clears throat> it's just kind of mushing down. So that's kind of how we would do that. If you're more aggressive in the in the entry, so A, you're flying along at, let's say, 60 knots, and you yank the stick that quick, you're going to end up with a very nose-high attitude. And then when she stalls, the nose is just going to drop, and the airplane will start flying again. Okay. Axes and movements. This is a really annoying one, folks. I'm not going to I'm not gonna kid you here. Um, when we talk about axes and movements, there's three axes. There's the vertical or the normal axes. That's a, an imaginary line that goes vertically down through the airplane. There's the longitudinal axis, which goes from nose to tip, or from nose to tail. And then there is the lateral axis that goes from tip to tip. And this is one of those annoying memorize it for the exam things. Now, the movement about the axes, so the vertical or normal axis, the movement about that is yaw. And if you are flying along and you step on your rudder left and right, the wings will stay level. The uh, nose will not pitch up and down. It'll just kind of go from left to right, side to side. And that motion is called yaw. Now, <clears throat> we refer to that as movement about the lateral axis. So if you see on the exam, it says, what is the movement about the lateral axis? Or excuse me, the vertical axis. Think of which axis we're talking about, and then picture the airplane moving around that, so as, as the arrows are sort of showing. Longitudinally, that would be roll, and laterally, that would be pitch. So the movement about the lateral axis is pitch. Here's the annoying part. Movement of the vertical axis is pitch. 
So movement of the vertical axes, if you tilt the vertical axes fore and aft, you're pitching. And hence, that's movement about the lateral. So for the exam, you really want to wrap your heads around this, because depending upon whether they say about or of. <clears throat> so the movement of the longitudinal axes is yaw, and the movement of the lateral axes is roll. <clears throat> okay. Um, so again, you know, be very clear on those before you go into your exam. And perfect. Okay. So um, we're just going to touch on two more quick points, and then we're going to take our break because we're approaching 8 o'clock. This next piece is called stability. And stability is described as the inherent tendency for the aircraft to return to its original state. So if we picture a half pipe, okay, so think about your your kids who are skateboarders or if you've ever seen, you know, one of those half pipes where, you know, you can kind of skateboard up and down. We take a ball and we go up to the top here and we let the ball go, it'll eventually stop down at the bottom. Okay. Now, if we take that ball and disturb it, so what we've done is we've, we've pushed the ball up here. If I let it go, it'll, it'll return back to the bottom. Now, because of momentum, it'll kind of go to this side and to this side, and it'll slowly get less and less and less and less and less. So after a couple of oscillations, <coughs> it will return to this state. An aircraft that does that would be considered or termed a stable airplane. Now, an unstable airplane would look like this. So this time we've put the ball on the top of a mound. And when it's disturbed, what's going to happen is it's going to keep going. And this is actually kind of well describes what a helicopter is like. Because a helicopter, you're kind of balancing on top of this column of air. And it's always wanting to fall off on one side or the other. So there's three types of stabilities. There's positive stability, there's neutral stability, and there's negative stability. This first one here, figure one, this is an example of positive stability. We have an original state, we disturb it, and then we let it to its own devices and it comes back to that level state. Now, many training aircraft are designed with positive stability. So if you hop in your Cessnas and you know some of the other training airplanes and you're kind of flying along and you you know put the, the ailerons in to do a bank and you you know bank say 20 degrees and let go of the stick, it'll often go back to its original level state. Now, unfortunately, aerodynamically, there's a cost because <coughs> the way you create stability is to create forces that are going to push the wings back to the level state. So in positive stability, you can see the original disturbance here, and the amplitude of the wave gets lower and lower and lower until it eventually returns back to its level state. A neutrally uh, unstable flight or a neutrally stable aircraft would look something like this, where you disturb it and it will actually oscillate and continue to oscillate at that. And it won't get worse, it won't get better. Or if I put it into the bank, let's say 40 degrees and let it go, it stays in the bank of 40 degrees. So both of those would be examples of neutral stability. They're not getting better, but they're not getting worse. Negative stability would look like this. We do the disruption. The first oscillation is pretty minor, it gets bigger, it gets bigger, it gets bigger. <coughs> and this is what we would call negative dynamic stability. In a negative stability situation, you need to take corrective action. And we're really now getting into a concept which we'll, we'll delve into a lot more in airmanship, which is to know your airplane. Is your airplane a neutrally stable, positively stable, or negatively stable? And a negatively stable airplane, what you're going to see is you have to be flying it every second of the day. Right? You can't let go because it's just it's going to go off the rails on you. A neutrally stable airplane is actually a lovely airplane to fly because whenever wherever you put it, it'll stay there. So um, remember flying a discus um, a few years back at Port Kurt's discus. Put it into a 45 degree bank for the for the thermal, let go of the stick, and we just sat there and went around and around and around. It was beautiful. But you had to correct it. The Crosno will tend to, to, you know, you put in a little bit of bank, it'll tend to roll itself back level. It's kind of somewhere between neutral and, and uh, positive. Most gliders tend towards neutral, right? Most gliders tend towards neutral. 
<clears throat> okay. Forget the mission. I got six knots up. We're going to take a quick little break here. Um, buddying. And what we'll do is we'll do a, uh, let's do a 10 minute break. Y'all should be able to see my timer now. I'm going to mute my microphone and I'm going to take my break and we'll see you back here in about 10 minutes. Sounds good.
All right, we're back. Um, if you're ever running a meeting, by the way, this is a great little utility. It's called XNote Timer, and you can have it. So it's starting to count up. Um, it flashes. It plays a little tone. You can have it launch a program. It's kind of cool. Works really well. <laughs> so for those of you still with us, which I think is still everyone, which is great, I thought I'd bring us back to a little fun video. Now, um, I've asked... Uh, I've asked Go Go to Webinar about this, and they haven't got a solution yet for the sound, so it'll be silent. But there's really not any sound on this, um, so you sort of hear the sounds of you know the air in the field. Ah, uh, the awesome fun that is winching. They just heard the clink of the release. <laughs> I love that one. All right. So just as we return... Um, when is Great Lakes going to get a winch? I agree, Dane. We're working on it. <clears throat> All right. Um, and by the way, if, if anyone wants to have some discussion around winching, um, I was just down at the Soaring Society <coughs> of America's conference <coughs> convention. I will be writing up, <coughs> excuse me, writing up my notes. Um, but I did go to, I think, three sessions around winching. And it's pretty amazing, some of the stuff there. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. There's one. It was a Dutch contest where they launched 45 gliders in 60 minutes off of a six-drum single winch. Um, so you think of a contest and you're trying to get, you know, multiple airplanes into the air, and even if you had five tow planes, you couldn't do that. So it makes a lot of sense. All right. So we're going to now move into taking what we have talked about with this whole thing around speed and the amount of lift and reaching the critical angle of attack and, and all these kind of things, and we're going to put it into the context of a glider. And in every glider manual, you're going to find a lift drag curve or what's often referred to as a polar curve. Now, the polar curve plots the sink rate, so here's the sink rate, versus the airspeed. And your polar curve defines what your glide ratio is. So when we talk maximum LD, which is lift over drag, so how can I maximize that so that I go the farthest distance? Now, this kind of almost airfoil-shaped curve down the bottom here is basically the speed of the aircraft plotted against the sink. So what you would do is you would take the airplane up into the air, go to a nice safe altitude, and you would fly it at different speeds, and you would record the airspeed, and you would record the vertical. Now, it doesn't matter what measurement you use, just make sure they're both the same. So whether you do it in knots or feet per minute or, you know, um, meters per second or, you know, whatever the number is. So in this particular example... <laughs> What do you think this point here on the curve represents? So why don't you just hop into your question box and type in what you think that point on the curve represents. Give a few, few moments to type that in. And you guys are all getting a perfect, awesome, I don't even need to be here. Um, this, this is the point of stall. Now, if we take a look at that, what's basically happening is if I started here at 47 knots, and I slow the airplane down, so I'm going to go from 47 to, let's say, 45, or maybe even all the way to 40. 
okay? I'm slowing down, so I'm losing lift. So as I slow down and lose lift, what's going to happen is I'm effectively going to start sinking. So as I speed up from, let's say, 40 knots up to 47, I'm going to start creating more lift. So when we get into this back side of the curve here, we're gotten to the point where our lift loss is actually greater than our speed reduction. Now, what's happening when we get down to this point in the curve, or this point in the curve, or this point in the curve? What's happening here? What's happening here? <clears throat> You're going down fast. <laughs> you got it, Tom. We're getting increased drag. So the reason that we don't kind of stay on a straight line, and you're right, Karen, we are descending. Um, the reason that we don't stay on a straight line is because as you increase speed, you increase drag. And you actually increase drag by a factor of square. So if you take the airspeed and you square it, and then you multiply it by the lift coefficient, which normalizes it to what the actual drag is, um, you take the airspeed squared, which means if you double the airspeed, you actually have four times the drag. And this is why as you increase speed and increase speed and increase speed, you start descending faster because you're now getting into a state. Oh, flying at non-ideal LD. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, now, there's there's two very important numbers on this this chart here. The first of which is when we take a line from zero and we draw it straight out until it intersects with our curve, in this case 47 and 1.2, we multiply that out and we have a 39.2 to 1 glide ratio. The second number is the very top of this because our, our, our best LD is actually a little bit faster than minimum sync. And it's kind of hard to see on this curve, but <clears throat> if I draw a straight line out here like this, now you, need, you see how the line here at 1.2 is actually dropping a little bit below here? If we kind of raise that up a bit, which will have a corresponding reduced speed where those two intersect, that's going to be my minimum sync speed. Now, best LD is the speed you want to fly when you want to go far. So you're at, you're at 5,000 feet. If you fly best LD, um, you're going to go almost 40 miles. If you want to stay in the air longer, you slow down just a little bit probably in this case to about 45, and you won't descend as fast. Now, you won't go as far, but if your purpose is to not go far, but actually stay in the air, and this is why, folks, when we roll into a thermal, we slow down. Because what you want to do is you want to decrease your speed to minimum sink so you can take the most advantage of that rising air. Then when you roll your wings level, you want to increase your speed back to best LD so that you can now go further. Now, for today, we're going to look at just the simple version, okay? When we get into cross-country, um, thermal and wave and those sorts of things, we're going to take a look at this again, and we're going to complicate it. <clears throat> we're going to look at things like a headwind, a tailwind. We're going to look at things like flying in sync, flying in lift, and what you should be doing and what speed you should be flying. And this concept is known as speed to fly. And this is where contest pilots win and lose the competition. So if I'm a contest pilot, my goal is to go the furthest, the fastest. Okay. So let's say we have a 300 kilometer track, a 300 kilometer task. If I can go around that 300 kilometers and get home first, I win. If we have like a time area task, for example, if I can maximize my distance that I've gone as well as maximize my speed, Again, I win, <clears throat> which means contest pilots are often moving down into this zone here and this zone here so that they can fly faster. And what they're basically doing is they're, they're trading off um, vertical performance for speed because they want to get around the course faster. So we would do that when we have very strong lifts so that we can use that strong lift to get us up high, and then we'll use that energy to run fast. Right? And again, we'll explore this in a lot more detail when we go into the cross-country um, section of our, of our program. Okay. Now, <clears throat> 
One of the other concepts, now we looked at this from the front, okay? So if you remember way back at the beginning, we looked at the glider from the side, excuse me, we looked at this from the side. Remember way back at the beginning, we looked at the glider from the side, and we took the glider where it was sitting dead upright, much like this one on the left. And then we tilted the nose down, right? So if this was from the side, you know, here's the nose, here's the tail kind of thing. So we're now gonna look at this concept from the front. And in level flight, I have my lift. So the distance from here to here is the same as the distance from here to here. So my lift equals my weight. Those two forces are equal and opposite. I'm in that state of equilibrium. Now, what's interesting with this concept is when I tilt the airplane to the side, watch what happens to the vertical lift component. So I'm gonna keep this line here the same. Okay, and notice what's happened. Look at this. So just like our pitching the nose down to create forward movement, when we drop a wing, it creates sideways movement because there's a portion of this lift that's now going this way and take carrying the airplane around the turn. <clears throat> so let me just clean up that drawing a little bit. Now, because of this, part of our vertical lift that was holding the airplane up is now being used to carry the airplane around in the circle. So without changing anything else, we're gonna start to descend. Now, if we do this in a power plane, we keep the, the engine setting the same, we keep the airspeed the same, we keep all that the same, we roll into that turn, what'll happen is the airplane will naturally start to descend. And this is why, folks, when you roll a glider into a turn, it wants to drop its nose and it wants to descend, right? Because we're now taking some of that lift and we're, we're, we're directing it off to the side, which is being used to pull the airplane around the corner. So what I need to do is I need to increase my lift. If I want to do a level turn, right, where this is right up to where it was, I need to increase my lift. Now, how can we increase our lift? And of course, in a, in a power plane, we can add power, right? But how can we increase our lift? Now we can gain speed. How do we gain speed? We'd have to add something into the system like an engine and, and, and rev it up, right? Now we can increase the lift by bringing the nose up, right? So in a glider, <clears throat> I really don't have a way of increasing the speed without lowering the nose. And when I lower the nose, I reduce the angle of attack, so I reduce the lift, so you actually descend. So in a glider, we really kind of can't do a level turn without losing some speed. Now, this can be a very dangerous situation because you notice that we need more lift to stay in the air. And what's gonna happen, <clears throat> so my question for you is what's the stall speed? What happens to the stall speed in a turn? I'll give you two options. It goes up or it goes down. We have an increased stall speed or we have a reduced stall speed. Wow, I'm kind of surprised, guys. I've got a few people saying reduced. Nope, it actually goes up. So let's take a look at this. <clears throat> In flat level flight, we have what's called a load factor of 1G. Let's say just for discussion's sake, our stall speed's 30 knots. At 15 degrees of bank angle, to maintain level flight, we now have a load factor of 1.4, which turns into 30.6 stall speed. Now, what's really telling here is when we get into a 45 degree bank turn, look at your stall speed. So the steeper you bank, the higher your stall speed is. And the reason for that is because we're trying to use part of the lift to pull us sideways, part of the lift to pull us up, and it's much easier for us to um, exceed the critical angle. Now, in a 60 degree bank turn in level flight, you're gonna be pulling two Gs. And we can do that in a glider, we just really can't sustain it. Okay, <clears throat> so if you're flying your pit special, 
and you you know increase the throttle, you can go from the zero bank turn to a 60 degree bank turn and stay in level flight and you'll be pulling two Gs. But you need to be adding energy to the system to be able to do that. But notice what's happening to your stall speed. It started at 30 and it went up to 42.3 which basically means if you're flying along at 40 knots and you roll it into a 60 degree bank turn and you try and you pull back on the nose to keep that bank turn level you're going to stall it's kind of what it what it means so when we talk about turns in a glider and your instructor gets really on you and says keep your speed keep your speed keep your speed basically what's happening is as you roll into that turn, your nose is going to lower a little bit to increase <coughs> the descent angle. Some of that newfound lift is going to be used to turn the plane. And that energy is going to be chewed up by turning the plane around as we pull G, because as you pull G, you slow the plane down. And you're now getting into a good, stable turn. Okay. Now... This kind of a concept for the exam, um, I hate to say know these numbers, but you kind of got to know these numbers for the, for the exam. As a pilot, however, I want you to understand these concepts because when you're thermaling and you've rolled it into that nice, beautiful 60-degree bank, you're going to get the buffet at a higher speed. right? And if you don't pay attention to that, you could stall the airplane, and now that you're in a bank, this <coughs> excuse me, the stall turns into a spin. Is this making sense? Yep, yes. Why? I like your efficiency, Tom. He just did a why. He was 33% more efficient than you other guys who actually typed yes or yep. All right. <laughs> All right. <coughs> Now, just before we continue on, um, <laughs> all right, just before we continue on, um, something we haven't really talked about yet is spoilers. Now, the spoilers are those control surfaces on the top of the wings. They're usually about midway out. They pop open. They reduce lift. They, re <coughs> they increase drag. And... Um, They increase lift, they increase drag, and uh, basically what happens is um, your wing is actually going to stall at a higher speed with the spoilers <laughs> deployed. Oh, it's going to grab a lozenge. Your wing will stall at a higher speed with the spoilers deployed versus with the spoilers in. So you may have heard your instructor tell you, go up to altitude, stall your airplane, in a landing configuration. So we think about how we configure our airplane for landing. Well, one thing we do is we lower the undercarriage. Another thing we do if we had flaps is we put the flaps into a landing setting. And another thing we're going to do is we're going to pull open the spoilers to control our descent. So what we want to do is we want to make sure we understand how much of an impact that, um, <clears throat> how much of an impact that will have on your aircraft. And um, I know Tom, our Tom, Tom Robertson, is very big on this, and I, I totally agree with him here, is you are much better and safer to close your spoilers for your turn. Now, again, know your airplane. If you're flying the Crosno or even the Poo Hatch, um, if you're coming in a little bit high and hot, like you're coming in too high and too fast, Get your turn done, roll your wings level, then pull your spoilers out. Because in both of those aircraft, you have highly, highly effective spoilers. So what's going to happen is you'll be able to get the airplane down into the glide path very, very easily. But if you pull them out while you're in that turn, you're increasing your stall speed, and you could actually um, get yourself into some trouble. Now, Chris has asked the question, what's the significance of the square root in drag? So... <clears throat> Um, the load factor is how much G's we pull. We do a square root of that. We multiply the square root times this. 
So if you take 30 times 7, you get 21. So 30 times 7, uh, so 3 times 7 is 21, and that's where this number comes from. So basically what's happening is there's some math happening here that basically says here's how you can calculate your stall speed at your various angles of attack, or at your various bank angles. Um, most, a lot of, a lot of um, flight manuals will actually have this in the, uh, in the flight manual. And if it doesn't, all you have to do is figure out your stall speed, plug the numbers in here, and, and you know, do the math. Okay. So this is one of those areas where you need to know these numbers for the exam, unfortunately. What I want you to know as a pilot, however, is the steeper the banking, the higher the stall speed. So, you know, we had a couple of incidences this year. Um, for those of you who have got your free flight and read um, the safety report, we had a couple of incidences of stall spins on, on final. Now, the good news is everyone survived, and in one case, the gentleman actually recovered and landed his airplane safely with no damage. But basically what happened is he rolled into his turn, he let his speed come back a little bit, and that, that led to a um, you know an upset, a, a stall spin. And fortunately, he was very quick in the recovery, so kudos there, um, and recovered the plane and, and landed safely. <clears throat> now, structural load factors, again, these are, are numbers to be aware of for the exam. But basically, um, a normal category airplane well, 3.8 to negative 1.52. And these are the, uh, if you want to get your airplane certified, in utility category. So this would be things like your airliners and your transports. And then, of course, you get into aerobatics. Now, these are the minimums. So, you know, you look at some of the very high-performance aerobatic ships, and they'll say, oh, yeah, we got, you know, we're 9 Gs positive and, you know, stuff like this. Um, <clears throat> these are the minimums to get within those categories. <clears throat> so, again, that's one of those, you know, sort of be aware of it. Okay, we're going to talk spins. Now, in a spin, you're basically in a stall. <coughs> and I scoured the web for a good graphic diagram of <coughs> a spin. And this is the best one I found. It's an ultralight, but all the stuff is relevant. So what we're looking at here is the outer wing is still producing lift. The inner wing is stalled. Now, when you stall a wing, two things happen. So again, in your in your box there, when you stall a wing, two things happen. And what I'm looking for here is I want to know what happens to the lift, and I want to know what happens to the drag. So what happens to lift, and what happens to drag when you stall the wing? <clears throat> And just to help you with that, let's sit back to this one here. What happens to lift? What happens with drag? You guys have been studying up. I'm liking this. <clears throat> now, at the point of stall, so we've got you know, this nice laminar flow here. We're flying along nice and efficient. We're starting to get a little bit more separation, right? So there's a little bit more turbulent flow. And then we get into this nasty stuff. And again, you can have some fun with this by sticking your hand out the window, driving along. I'd recommend you wait till summer. Driving along, start your hand nice and flat, and then slowly tilt it up. What's going to happen is you're going to feel the drag increasing, but you're also going to feel the lift. And then you keep rotating, and the lift will stop, but the drag will continue. And in fact, the, the, the drag will actually even get worse. Right? <clears throat> so, <coughs> the answer here is the wing that is stalled is going to have increased drag and it's going to have reduced lift. So, if one wing is flying and the other's not, the wing that's not flying is going to drop. So if we can think about a time, we've been flying along, we're approaching stall, and just at the point of stall, one wing drops down. What's happening there is the wing dropping has stalled before the wing that's not dropping. And as soon as that happens, the airplane starts to yaw or turn towards the dropped wing. Because what's happening here is the drag has increased, which is going to pull the wing backwards, what this arrow is representing. 
<clears throat> the lift has decreased, so the wing's going to drop down. This wing is still flying, so it's relatively less lift, so it's going to keep moving forward through the air. And it's actually going to start going up because relative to the other wing, there's more lift. Now, as long as we let this continue, um, as long as we let this continue, that inner wing is going to stall and potentially stay stalled. The outer wing is going to keep flying, and we're going to end up in this circle as we spiral down. Okay. Now, how do we stop this? So what do we do to fix this situation? So we're in our airplane. We've just stalled. The one wing dropped. We're starting to spiral down. What do we do? Okay, I'm getting answers like drop the nose, opposite rudder, nose down, lower the flying wing to the point, uh, point the nose down, uh, use opposite rudder to stop the spin, allow airspeed to build, and then of course we pull out. Now, <coughs> notice all the answers had use the rudder. Um, this is kind of really key here, folks. Because this wing is stalled, so if I apply aileron, so if I look at the aileron on this wing, it's no longer flying. And in fact, if I decrease the aileron, so if I take the aileron, so if here's my wing, okay, and if I take the aileron and I put it on a down angle, what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to increase the, the angle of attack. <clears throat> so what you want to do is you want to neutralize your ailerons, <clears throat> put them in the center. Then you're going to stomp in a boot full of rudder, and you're going to hold it until the airplane stops rotating. Now that you've stopped rotating, both wings are in the same air, because when you're rotating, one wing is going very, very slow, and one wing is going fast, because you're spinning around. So now that you've stopped the rotation, the stalled wing will start flying again. And what's going to happen is you are going to pick up airspeed. You will probably already be nose down, depending upon the glider type. The poo hatch, for example, the stall recovery is neutralize the ailerons, opposite rubber, rudder, and then move the stick forward until the rotation stops. Now, in the Crosno, it doesn't like to spin, so we tend to find that, you know, even before you can get to real opposite rudder, I mean, you're pretty much almost getting them to neutral and it, it pops out on its own. <clears throat> If you have never experienced a real spin, I encourage you to go to a club that has an airplane that will spin. Um, Toronto Soaring has the Poo Hatch, which is a wonderful spinning airplane, so go visit them and go for a couple spins. Uh, York Soaring has a 233, or 232, excuse me, which is very similar to the Poo Hatch in its performance and spin characteristics. It actually even spins more than the Poo Hatch does. Um, I'm not sure out in Winnipeg, because I know you've got your two Crosnos, and you've got, you've got the same issue that we do. Um, so maybe check out uh, another close club that has an airplane that spins. Uh, a K21 with the tail weights is another good option. But you want to experience a real spin <clears throat> sometime in your flying career and understand how to get out of it. Now, <clears throat> here is the progression of a spin. First thing, to spin an airplane, you first have to stall it. Until you stall the airplane, it will not spin. So you can throw that airplane all over the sky, and as long as you do not exceed the critical angle of attack, you will never get into a spin because you won't stall, and then hence you won't get into the spin. But if you stall and one wing drops, so you can see here this wing has dropped, that wing's going to stay stalled, or even deep in the stall, the other wing's going to unstall, and you're going to start the rotation. Now, what's going to happen is you're going to, you're going to kind of spin around like this, down, down, down. <clears throat> this is what's known as the incipient stage. Just like about everything in life, the earlier you can correct it and fix it, 
the better off you are. So we're flying along. Maybe we've, we've raised the nose to take advantage of some lift. We've rolled into a turn, and that wing starts to drop. What will we do right at this position here? The nose is starting to drop. The wing is starting to drop. I'm using a bit of aileron. It's not coming up. What could I do to fix this before it develops into a full spin? <laughs> I love your wording, Karen. Slam opposite rudder. Right? So Chris is saying stop the rotation. Absolutely. And we use the rudder to do that. So we're seeing lots of rudder, hard opposite rudder, and nose down. Right? Because if I just put opposite rudder in, I actually have the possibility that I could actually cant the airplane around and actually go into spin in the other direction. So yes, we want to put in rudder, but maybe not necessarily slam. Now what you want to do is go up to altitude and practice this so that you know how your airplane responds. But lower the nose, <clears throat> which unloads the wings, reduces the angle of attack. Use any rudder you need to stop that rotation. And if you catch it early enough, what will basically happen is you'll have a little bit of a roll, maybe 10, 15 degrees. Then your wings will come back level again and you'll start flying. So if we think about thermaling, we're going round and round in the circle, and we've got that nose up, we're trying to slow down. <coughs> that inner wing starting to drop, we're getting the buffeting. Lower the nose a little bit. Okay. Now, you do not want to be picking up with aileron, because especially in an aircraft like the Jantar or the Puhatch, you start doing that, and it'll, you're basically asking the airplane to spin. So apply a little bit of opposite rudder, lower the nose, get the airplane flying again. And again, go up to altitude and practice this, practice this, practice this. <clears throat> if we don't fix it in the incipient stage, we get into a fully developed spin, and then we get into the recovery, and what you can see here is we've got a very high rate of rotation, and then the rotation stops. I'm now in a dive, and I recover from the dive. I love this piece here. Manufacturers recommend a recovery altitude minimum of 2,000 feet AGL. Now, where this is going to catch you is when you're on final. At, what we want to do is make sure that we're not being caught at that low level. So go up to a nice high altitude. And this is why we go to 4,000 feet in our spring checks. <laughs> so we can recover nice and high. But you want to pay attention to what your airplane is telling you because it, it's talking to you. And it's saying, hey, hey, dude, I'm going to spin, I'm going to spin. Right, because you get the buffet, you get the um, wing drop, you know, you get the mushy control. <laughs> so, you know, pay attention to that. In the training, are we going to practice a fully developed, fully developed stage or incipient stage? Um, both. So Svetvan was just asking that. Um, <clears throat> now. Um, I'm a big fan of the incipient stage and identifying it early and fixing it early, but we also need to know how to um, get out of it should it, you know, more develop. Okay. And when we get into airmanship, we'll we'll kind of revisit this topic. Um, a the other thing you want to do is you want to look at how much altitude you need to recover from a spin, um, and depending upon the aircraft and how much the the spin develops. Uh, it comes down really, really quite fast. So you're in an almost a vertical nose di down attitude. <clears throat> okay. So here is the stages of a spin. Sorry, it's going to respond to something here. Okay, um, the entry to the spin. Pilot does something stupid. So basically, the pilot allows the airplane to slow down, maybe rolls into a turn at too low a speed, that kind of stuff. In the incipient stage, the aircraft stalls and the rotation begins. Now, from the cockpit, here's what you're going to see. You're slowing down, right? You may be getting some of those warning signs like, Less air, le less wind noise over the canopy. Uh, you may be getting the kind of you know the controls are a little bit mushy. Those sorts of things. That's the the pilot does something stupid part. 
You then stall the airplane and one wing drops. And as soon as that wing drops, the rotation starts. So <clears throat> now it's a question of do I fix it quickly or do I let it develop? And the longer I let it develop, the more we get into that vertical component here where we can see you know, dramatic drops in altitude. So again, if I can recognize the stall early and the rotation beginning, I can take corrective action. And then as it's developed, we're into rotation. Now, with a fully developed spin, I want you to think about what happens to your airspeed. Airspeed and speed. <laughs> oh my goodness. I think I might have been on something when I wrote this one. All right. <laughs> I think I, what you want to do is you think about your airspeed and your vertical speed. Ag, I just gave it away. Um, I want you to think about your airspeed and your vertical speed. And what do those look like? Do they increase? Are they stable? Do they decrease? And this is when we're fully developed in the spin. So if I kind of go back to here for a second, we're talking about this, this section here. <clears throat> oh, Razvan, you got it half right. Okay, we need to do some work here, folks. This is an important one for you. Both the airspeed, the ver the airspeed and the vertical speed are stable. <laughs> so what's going to happen is when you go into a spin, and this is a proper fully developed spin, your airspeed is going to be stable, so you're going to sit there at, you know, 50 knots or whatever the number is and your vertical speed is going to be stable now the vertical speed is going to be quite high um, but it's going to kind of you know continue down um, I see Neil you put your hand up I'm just going to unmute you for a sec did you have something nope nope cool <clears throat> so when you're in a spin because of the extra drag of that stalled wing, it's creating so much drag, yes, you will initially uh, accelerate a little bit when you start into the spin, but once it's fully developed, the airspeed will stabilize and the vertical speed will stabilize. And you will basically drill down through the sky at a constant rate of speed, both forward and vertical. Um, now, those, those numbers are quite high. I mean, you're, you're traveling at a good, good clip but you're not going to overspeed the airplane. So when you stall that airplane, you increase so much drag with that stalled wing. And when you've got an airplane like a poo hatch that will get into a stable stall, <coughs> it will actually continue to just circle down to the ground at that constant speed. Now, this is very important because what we need to do is we need to recognize whether we're in a spin or a spiral dive. And the biggest indicator is your speeds. Now, a spin versus a spiral dive, first of all, the aircraft is stalled and you're in stable flight. And there used to be, and the, depending upon the glider that you're in, a way of getting down through the clouds if you've if you've kind of gotten, you know, you're up nice and high <laughs> and the clouds have closed below you. A way you can get down through that is to put the aircraft into an intentional spin. Now, know your airplane. With something like a Poo Hatch or a Crosno, do full spoilers and do a benign spiral. We'll talk more on that later. A spin, however, you're stalled and you're stable. In a spiral dive, the airplane is flying and your speed is increasing. Okay. So what you're going to feel in the cockpit... Um, what you're going to feel in the cockpit in a spiral dive is you're going to feel like you're being pressed down into the seat. You're going to feel acceleration. And think about a ballerina or a, a nice dance skater, and they're spinning, and they pull all the, 
you know, the stuff into the center and they spin faster, right? So that's what's going to happen in your spiral dive. And the more you pull back on the stick to try and pull out of the dive and slow the airplane, the faster it's actually going to go. In a spin, however, <clears throat> with the aircraft stalled, you're going to just be sitting there flying. And well, stalled, but you're dropping. But it's at a constant speed. So you're not going to be being pressed down into the seat under high G. You're just going to be kind of, you know, floating down like a leaf almost. So uh, Dane has asked a quick question. I don't understand how it doesn't increase until terminal velocity. And Dane, you actually answered your own question. It does increase to terminal velocity. But because I've got a stalled wing, I've got a huge amount of drag. So my terminal velocity is much lower than if I was in, you know, unstalled flight. So if I took the airplane and just level wings, pushed the nose down and, you know, pointed it straight down to the earth, it would keep speeding up and speeding up and speeding up. And I don't have enough drag to compensate for that gravity and eventually I'll overspeed the airplane. But if I do it in a spin, the extra drag caused by the stalled wing is going to counteract the gravity to the point where the two of them equal each other. And I've now effectively reached terminal velocity. And if you think about a parachuter, aha, if you think about a parachuter, terminal velocity without the parachute open is much, much higher than terminal velocity with the parachute open. And it's kind of that same concept because that parachute creates a whole bunch of, of lift and drag. I and mean, if you look at the old round parachutes, they didn't create any lift. They just created a whole mess load of drag. And that's how we slowed down to a, a, a gentle enough descent to not, not, you know, cause ourselves injury. Now, the next very important piece here, so now that we've recognized what's going on, you know, stalled and stable versus flying at increased speed, we need to look at the recoveries. And here's the key, folks. The rudder versus the ailerons. Okay. So, <clears throat> in the stalled spin flight, my inside wing which is causing the rotation, is stalled. <clears throat> so I cannot use the aileron to pick it up because it's not flying. And in fact, most airplanes get really upset with you when you try to do that. So it's very important to put the aileron to neutral, use the rudder to stop the rotation. Second rotation stops, that wing starts flying, you're going to see the speed start to pick up real quick and you, you pull out of that dive. Now, in the spiral dive, the airplane is still flying. So therefore, your ailerons control the rotation. So it's really key to recognize, am I in a spin or am I in a spiral, spiral dive? And when you go up with an instructor, get them to demonstrate both. Okay. Now, the spiral dive happens very, very quickly because you don't have very much drag and you're kind of pointing down. And this is often referred to as the death spiral. Uh, this is one of those, you know, the whole JFK thing, the, you know, flying at night or in clouds and they lose reference and they drop a wing and it, it kind of spirals down. So in the spin, use rudder to stop the rotation. In the spiral dive, use ailerons to stop the rotation. <laughs> oh my goodness, thank you, Svetvan. That was just too funny. Um, apparently, we have a very flexible rudder. Oh my goodness. You know, we've been using this, this presentation for a number of years. <laughs> I'm surprised no one's noticed that before. Oh, that is just too funny. There we go. Oh, that's brilliant. Love it. All right. Thanks, dude. Ah, uh, okay. Let's move on. Oh, yeah? You said you were in control. Now, this, this cartoon, which is actually driven, writ, written by um, Mike Morgan of Toronto Soaring, really good cartoonist. This was actually inspired by a true story. Um, a, an instructor landed with a student stood up in the back seat and started berating the student in the front seat. And the student in the front seat turned around and looked at me and says, I thought you were flying. Um, so this is why we're so um, particular around the whole, you know, who's flying the airplane, the handover of control, 
um, you know, all that kind of stuff, right? So we want to make sure that it's it's very clear and we don't end up flying along in an airplane um, where no one's actually in control, right? So this is why we're so particular on this. Ah, I think I've probably given you enough for one night to chew on and think about. Um, hey, look at that. We're five minutes early. Woohoo. I'm going to leave it open for a few minutes if anyone has any questions. And what I'm going to do is let's just unmute everyone. So I'm just kind of unmuting everyone. Pavel there. Oh, starting to hear stuff. All right. I think I got just about everyone unmuted. All right. Uh, any questions? Anything you guys want to go over before we, we call it a night? I got a quick one if I can. Absolutely. Who's um, speaking? It's, sorry, it's Tom. Hey, Tom. So uh, before we were talking about the angle of attack, mm -hmm. um, you mentioned when the angle of attack exceeds, what was that part that we were mentioning? The critical angle. Critical, angle. critical angle, then the wing stalls, correct? Correct. And, and this is probably the best graphic for that. Um, you can actually, if you go to the NASA site, um, apologies, I've been very busy, but I didn't have a chance to, um, I actually found this as an animation. And what you can do is you can change the angle of attack, and then you can see at the point at which the wing stalls. Um, now, what's interesting with this whole concept, and this is something that we touched on with the airplane graphic, um, I can actually take this, uh, where are we, there we are, and if we rotate this like this, right, so if I'm, if I'm diving towards the earth and I pull out real quick, that's how you can exceed the critical angle of attack, even though your airplane is technically pointed nose down. Mm -hmm. Now, um, all airplanes um, stall at a given angle of attack, and <clears throat> that angle is known as the critical angle. For most planes, it's somewhere around 17 degrees. But you know what? The number 17 degrees is meaningless to you when you're in the cockpit. What you want to know is that if you pull that nose up high enough and you're kind of going along level, you're going to stall the wing. Mm -hmm. Right? So how do we prevent stalling the wing? Nose down. Nose down. You got it. <laughs> right? And especially when you get into a winch scenario, here you're bugging along at like 45 degrees nose up. Now, you're going forward pretty quick right? because that winch is, is pulling you forward. When that winch cable breaks, you're now pointed 45 degrees up. What's going to happen to your airspeed? Yeah, it's just going to stop. It's just going to stop, right? So you, you're going along at like 60 knots. You've got about three or four seconds before that 60 knots turns into about you know 30 or 40 knots. And the real danger here is that you know you're going along, you're pointing way up in the nose, and boom, your your winch cable breaks, and you spend a couple of seconds going, "What just happened?" Right? What you need to do is you need to be pushing that stick forward right away. Mm -hmm. And there's actually, um, uh, you should go negative G. So you should have stuff floating in the cockpit when you do this. <laughs> okay? And if you Google this, and what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll I downloaded a couple of YouTubes of this. Because um, <clears throat> um, I, was, I was doing a little bit of research on this. Um, Google this and, and find a video of an actual winch break in the air. Let me just see if I have it handy. Um, um, if you look at it and you see the guys who are doing it right, they go completely negative and there's stuff floating all over the place. Okay. So you know what? Let me just see if I can just find it real quick. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I love the internet, eh? <laughs> Beauty of actual winch break. Cool. Okay. Um, I think it's this one. Okay, so there's the, the takeoff. There's the break, and watch what he does. Look at all that stuff floating around. Uh -huh. You can see okay. the seed belt popping up and everything. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Now, what's interesting on this, 
is what I want you to take a look at is his altimeter right here. Okay. Um, I don't know where this dude's flying, but it looks like he's starting at 7,000 feet. So he's already at, at kind of a high density altitude, right? But watch what happens. Now, it just broke, and he's at 7,100, yeah? Yeah. Okay. He does the pushover into negative G. What altitude is he at? So he didn't lose any altitude on it. He actually gained. Yeah. Right? And this is this is the yeah. big thing that so many people are scared of on winches is, you know, they have a brake close to the ground, and they don't want to push the nose forward because they're scared they're going to slam into the ground. But what's going to happen? That's counter it's is counterintuitive. It's it like is counterintuitive. But if you let the speed lead <laughs> off, okay, if you let the speed lead off, that's going to that's what's going to slam you into the ground, mm -hmm. right? And at one of the SSA sessions, and uh, Neil, um, I can't remember. Does Winnipeg have a um, winch? No. No. Okay. Um, I'm going to share this with uh, the CFI at at Toronto Soaring. I just got to write up my notes. Um, he actually ran the numbers on this. Now, the guy who did this is not a winch flyer. So he's not doing this from a, a feel perspective. He's doing it from a raw numbers perspective. And what he did is he put together a spreadsheet where he calculated the, um, you know, the rate of deceleration on the airplane and how much height you need to recover and all this kind of stuff. And what he found was the key here is to get that nose down as absolutely quickly as possible and the way to do that is to go into negative G, right? So, you know, we replay this. You know, here he is rolling, okay? Nose up. He has, he's, he's maybe 100 feet, right? But then he, negative G, there's all the stuff floating around, right? It actually whacks him in the head, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Why we want to keep those little side pockets in there, yeah? Um, he does the negative G, and look at his altitude. He finishes recovery at around 250 feet. And look at the field in front of him. Has he got any problems at this point? Right? He's got a nice, easy landing to do. Right? So all he has to do now is just keep the airplane under control, keep it flying, keep his airspeed up, and just execute a normal landing. Right? Now, sometimes, depending upon the height and where you are, you're going to do a U-turn. You're going to, you know, winch break, turn around, and head back the other way. And here's the danger. If I'm not super quick on that lowering the nose, I've lost my airspeed. I'm into that high angle of attack. Although my nose is level, I'm not flying yet, and I roll into a, into a turn. So as a simple rule of thumb for you, for anyone who goes on the winch, however nose up you are, that's how nose down you want to be. Okay? So however nose up you are, that's how nose down you want to be. So if you are 40 degrees nose up, push that stick forward, get 40 degrees nose down. Um, in the first about two, 300 feet of the winch launch, you're slowly rotating between level flight up to that 45 degree vertical. So if you kind of follow this rule... Um, what you're going to find is, uh, oh, I thought this one was a winch break as well. Now it says 130 meters. Oh, there it is. It's much earlier in the video. So there he's going up. And wait for it. There's the brake. There's the forward. See the straps floating around? He pulls the release. Look at that lowering the nose, right? That's classic. That's textbook. He went from that high nose up attitude, right? Bang, there's the, the thing. Nose forward, nose forward, nose forward. Lower that nose, lower that nose. And look at how far down his nose is. Right, to regain that flying speed. The sooner you do that, the less speed you'll lose. Because you've got that momentum going up. You rotate the airplane, you get it into flying attitude. Now you've got some airspeed and some stuff. And the reality is, if you're going to be 10 or 15 feet above the ground when the winch breaks, you're not going to be 45 degrees nose up. Cool. Any other questions? All right. Shall we call it a day? Get better for the next one. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I will do my better. best.
I am, I am going to go straight from here and crawl into a nice warm bed and sleep for 12 hours. Good. All right, folks. Um, if you have any questions or anything uh, through the week or can think of something, feel free to email me. Okay. Stop the recording.